Okay, we'll start with our cases. So, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome back again to our uh, by our Friday sessions. Thanks again, Aigen and uh, Dr. Mangat for joining us. Pleasure. We have 10 cases, 10 new cases, and uh, two follow up cases with uh, a likely confirmatory diagnosis. First case is from um, Rainbow Hyderabad. Pituja, if you're there, you can present the case. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, she's a 10 years old female child with moderate grade fever since 10 days. Uh, there was no encephalopathy or features of raised ICP or focal deficits. Uh, but on examination, she had meningeal signs positive. Um, and we went ahead with the MR on day 10, is that right? Yes, sir. MRI was done on day 10 of illness, sir. We did the brain and spine. Uh, we show the spine images as the predominant findings are in the spine. Uh, so on the sagittal non-contrast T2 weighted images, you can appear that there is a long segment of myelitis or myelopathy, non-compressive myelopathy extending from the cervical to up to the um, lower th thoracic part. Post on, on the axial images, non-contrast again over here, you can appreciate that it is predominantly involving the gray matter and also some areas of the posterior columns in the cervical region. Some central areas were also involved in the thoracic region over there, but predominant gray matter involvement with some uh, white matter involvement. Post contrast study, uh, we did not appreciate any um, enhancement of the spinal cord hyperintensities, no cord echo and ergot enhancement, uh, no bony abnormalities. A brain was done, and we have the posterior fossa images on top. You can appreciate that there are some patchy hyperintensities involving the dorsal bonds over there, the medullary pyramids. Uh, the dentate nuclei also slightly hyperintense on both sides. Again, flare hyperintensities in the medullary pyramids. Coming to the supratentorial brain, um, there was only some asymmetry of the periventricular white matter, whether this is significant or not, better appreciate on the flare images. As you can see over here, um, there is no lining between the white matter and the ependyma to say that it's possibly a terminal zone of myelination. Um, and on the sagittal images, again, you can appreciate the hyperintensities of the cord extending up to the uh, lower brain stem. Post-contrast optic nerves do not demonstrate any enhancement over there. Based on the imaging pattern, predominantly involving the spine, this is a, a nice poster from Dr. Julia. And there was predominant gray matter involvement in our case. So we thought of a possibility of viral etiology or mob-related uh, antibody disorder or a demyelinating disorder. So central causes also were kept in mind such as acute transverse myelitis, but the predominant feature was the gray matter involvement. So these were the differentials. Uh, the most common uh, infections involving the spine and the lower brainstem is enterovirus. And you can appreciate from the cases in the literature over there, the imaging findings are pretty similar to our case. Long segment involvement, predominant involvement of the gray matter. Uh, again, this is another example with uh, patchy involvement of the cerebellum and long segment uh, extensive cord myelitis. These are the other differentials of the viral infections causing similar pattern of involvement and some bacterial infections over there. Uh, demyelinating cause was kept in mind, predominantly the MOG antibody related disorders and possibly NMO if the left periventricular region was uh, pathological rather than a, just a terminal zones of myelination. So both viral and demyelinating were kept in mind and evaluated. Devanga? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, so CSF was done on day 10 of illness, which showed 230 cells with uh, uh, polymorphic predominance, the protein of 96 and uh, sugars of 33. Other serologies, NMO MOG was negative, mycoplasma line serology was negative, CSF PCR for viral and bacterial panel was negative, and gene expert uh, was also negative for the child, sir. So I'll open the case for the panelists and others to comment upon now. Are those cells predominantly lymphocytes then in the CSF? Uh, no, sir. Polymorphic predominance. Polymorphs, okay. Yes. I have missed the clinical presentation apart from meningeal signs. Uh, so moderate fevers for and uh, no encephalopathy with features of raised ICP. What means focal deficits? 
uh, sir, no and uh, no encephalopathy. There was no focal deficits or no signs of raised ICP. Only uh, huh. she had okay. meningeal signs positive. Sir. Okay, so no refers to focal deficit. Yeah, Thank you. And is the cerebellum inflamed as well, Nihal? Yeah, there was some patchy hypertensives. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of uh, entities like enteroviruses, I think you should still look primary viral first, isn't it? The brain stem also has got changes. Uh, Bangna was uh, enterovirus included in the vital panel? or? Uh, yes, sir. enterovirus was included in the vital panel, sir. You may have to check for enteroviruses in the stools as well, because we've had a couple of cases where it wasn't found anywhere else but in stools. What kind of treatment have you given, if you have given it something at all? Uh, so, uh, she had received uh, five doses of injection methylprednisolone IV, and uh, with that she had shown improvement, sir. Thank you. Okay, so we're still thinking viral as a primary possibility. Maybe check for stools as Dr. Mahmoud said. Uh, yeah, is, are, the, are the caudate nuclei involved too, like basal ganglia side of things on that third picture below? Um, no, this is how we usually get our flare. So. Is it? Okay. Looks the a bit bright. Some, up there. Yeah. The only thing was there was some. The there is. The there is. Yeah. But still, it still doesn't go away from the differentials of viral and. No, it does not. I would give a primary viral etiology here first. Got it. Devangna, any other questions? Uh, no, sir. That's it, sir. Just we wanted to rule out whether any infective or demyelination was okay, further. So there's a question of CSF biofire. I don't think it was done. Uh, CSF biofires are similar to the CSF uh, the bacterial and viral panel, so PCR panel, yeah. Uh, PCR panel. Yeah. So we did it, I think, and then a couple of odd points to consider demyelinating as well, which made us think more in terms of uh, infective etiologies, uh, stretch pains and root signs that would take us away from the demyelinating disorders clinically as well. Uh, yeah, but we couldn't prove the etiology. We repeated CSF uh, after seven days. Uh, and the repeat CSF was completely normal. So probably we're still thinking in terms of infective etiologies only, which we are unable to identify. I think uh, we can proceed uh, doing enterovirus and stool as uh, Dr. Mankert said. Okay, right, thank you. Yeah, sure. Well, now you can uh, answer the chat if there's any questions on the case. Okay, our next case is from uh, Bhati Udhyapit, Ramani. Yes, sir. Sir, am I audible? Yeah. Yeah. So, sir, this is a case of seven-month-old baby, uh, mainly came with the complaints of severe global developmental delay. So, this child uh, is the first born to a non-consanguinous uh, marriage. Um, antenatal history is completely normal. Birth history wise, full term, normal birth history, normal vaginal delivery, three kilos, uh, cried immediately after the birth, no history of NICU stay. But the child has not attained any milestones like head holding, social smile, any visual, sorry, that is visual fixation. Uh, nothing he has attained, but the parent says that he responds to noise by turning uh, towards the noise, the turning head. That is the only thing and opening eyes when they make a noise. So with these complaints, he has come. He never had any seizures. He never had any hospitalizations prior. On examination, we found uh, he, uh, from head to toe, there is no as such dysmorphism, but sparse hair and seborrheic dermatitis was there there uh, and uh, eyes are also normal fundus normal no cherry red spot uh, no dysmorphism feeding well sleeping well uh, but there is a profound hypotonia there is a head lack rounding of the trunk is there and um, uh, upper limbs power was two by uh, sorry more than three by five against the gravity is there but lower limbs the power is only two by five we asked the parents uh, that they never noticed uh, any anti-gravity movements of lower limbs like uh, taking the legs into the mouth or something 
only sideways movements are there, but reflexes are there. Definitely they are elicitable, but difficult to elicit one plus. Uh, and so we are suspecting it as like a central hypotonia and uh, no dysmorphism. So we did a workup uh, for central hypotonic causes. The VEP and the BERA were normal. We repeated BERA and we did the VEP that was normal. So we have sent MRI brain. Also, we are thinking of mitochondrial pathology. We have sent MRI brain with MRS. Okay. And uh, EMG, sorry, sir. Yeah, go ahead, sorry. EMG NCV was done. It is normal. Uh, we have sent a whole exome with mitochondrial genome panel, okay. which is awaited. We'll look at the images uh, first and then maybe you can go as follow. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, is that six months, Brahmini? Sir, at six and a half months. Okay, so there is a slightly delayed malnation of the T2 weighted sequences. The paracentral white matter should be uh, dark, but it's slightly hyperintense over there. The sperm is also not completely dark. There's some delayed malnation. Anterior limbs, though, around seven to nine months, but still uh, one would expect some myelination uh, starting in the anterior capsules. So it is slightly a delayed myelinated brain in the supratentorial white matter. Some degree of uh, prominence of the subarachnoid spaces around the frontal and the um, front lateral convexities. Um, on the T2, I hear in the cisterns, you can appreciate that the there is some type of tortuosity of the intracranial arteries, not, not very significant, but not normal also. So there's some degree of tortuosity. And um, cerebellum, there is some degree of volume loss over there. Brainstem does not demonstrate any signal changes, no signal abnormalities in the uh, basal ganglia. On the T1-weighted sequences, again, um, nothing very significant. Uh, again, you can appreciate the third image demonstrating some degree of tortuosity of the intracranial arteries. Diffusion-weighted sequences, we had the symmetrical areas of uh, restricted diffusion in the bilateral globa pallidae demonstrating low signals on the ADC. No corresponding mineralization. The MIP images again has some tortuosity, but not that significant. Um, there is plagiocephaly along the posterior aspect. The, on the certain images, the brainstem is hypoplastic. Uh, the vomis is also the inferior vomis is slightly hypoplastic. And you can appreciate the cerebellar atrophy on the coronal images over there. Prominence of the subarachnoid spaces, I did not have a flare to see if there is a, there are thin subdural collections or not, but they look like prominent subarachnoid spaces. And uh, spectroscopy, the intermediate T had a very mild, minor lactate peak at around here, at 1.3, and the rest of the peaks did not demonstrate any significant abnormalities. The spinal cord SAG was done without an axial. Um, so I'm not sure if this is the heparin density of the cord is um, real or just artifactual. And this was a stirred image. Um, de depending on if you concentrate on the uh, lower paradigm, uh, images, um, abnormalities, uh, these are the possible differentials, uh, lactate, I mean, we had a minor, la small lactate peak, so mitochondrial, especially the pyruvate complex disorders is a consideration. The other differentials are uh, listed over here, though I don't think they clinically match. The child may be hypotonia, there was no creatinine deficiency, so creatinine deficiency is ruled out. So thinking of a possible mitochondrial disorder with, um, and child also had cerebral atrophy, so, Again, signal changes in the basal ganglia. A mitochondrial disorder is something to be considered. And this is a paper from Ivan. Yeah, Roman. Yeah. So, uh, part of our cup, uh, we admitted the child for CSF. Actually, CSF protein is normal. CSF lactate is mildly elevated. Uh, protein is also prolactin was done 26.3 the cutoff was 20 so it is also badly raised and TMCMS recent has come it is showing also mild lactate and uh, urinary ketone values wise normal but excretory pattern they mentioned as suggestive of mitochondrial disorder so we are actually waiting for that but uh, when we discussed that MRI it has shown some hemorrhagic foci uh, is that there sir so that's why we have kept it for discussion is it like and also for global pallid uh, hyperintensive mitochondrial disorders, particularly. Yeah, they are. I cannot see hemorrhage. These are just vessels. The only question was um, the tortuosity and maybe some subdural, but it doesn't fit into Menke's disease and the lesions yeah. in the base ganglia. Hair wise, is hair texture is normal. Yeah, even the base ganglia is certainly asymmetric from Menke's. So they're not that similar. Okay. Sir. Yeah, so I'll open the case for the panelists to comment on. Can, can, can you elaborate on the excretory pattern of ketones? Uh, uh, 
What is that service stock mitochondrial? Uh, so they just mentioned. I mean, they didn't mention anything. The excretory pattern. I I'll discuss with my geneticist. Okay. What is the excretory pattern suggest of mitochondrial pathy? But the values I saw that it is in the normal range. There is no ketonuria as such. Could you also include the differential of lysosomal storage disorders at this point? Mm. Imaging, perspective. Imaging perspective, uh, I think if we are talking about delayed or hypomyelinating pattern with cerebellar atrophy and those thalami looked a bit small as well, concomitantly bright on the T1-weighted sequences, I would include lysosomes. I mean, how definitive are you that the excretory pattern is typical for mitochondrial? We'll discuss, sir, but... Uh... Uh, and the tortuosity of the vessels don't tie in with anything, right, Nihal? Yeah, I thought Minkia and connective tissue disorders, but it doesn't tie in. I mean, they are a little more significant and more tortuous, at least for the Minkia yeah, But it is it is quite a strong feature here, isn't it, those vessels? But I think as it evolves, the second picture with the palatal changes kind of, again, swayed me more towards mitochondrial anyways. But you might have to then also think about organic acids and some kind of baseline screening, isn't it? For that, uh, we have sent TMS, uh, the GC, TMS, uh, that is normal, actually. Yeah, there's a question about biotin it is. We did not biotin see- Biotin levels are normal. Yeah, but we didn't see this uh, MR pattern in any of the cases that we picked up with biotin it is deficiency either. Why is the basal ganglia like dot-like changes? Why is it just like a dot and not like the full? Um, it's primarily in the global paradigm. So mm, just like a dot, mm, no? Mm. The pyruvate complex disorders and the uh, um, I think the ECHS one have predominant involvement of the global paradigm rather than the lentiform nucleus. Oh, I see. Okay. Maybe later on it might become more confluent, but it can be. Mm. So we hope for a solution by genetic investigations. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And also, he has the undescended testes. One one of the feature is there, sir. And I forgot to mention he has no nystagmus or any organomegaly. Although liver is just palpable, but we cannot call it as organomegaly. Just palpable. And he cries often uh, while passing urine. That is the main complaint from the parents. We did urine routine, urine culture, everything is normal. That is one complaint. He had perianal rash which subsided on giving a topical ointments. Okay. Um, get back to us with a... Uh... Yes, sir, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, someone has mentioned AP4M1 gene mutation. Um, I've not come across this one. If Martin can elaborate if that's mitochondrial gene or mm. all four mutations any neurotransmitter disorders any possibilities are because prolactin is mildly high but i don't know um, Martin's point about AP4M1 is interesting but they generally get spasticity um, which is progressive if i'm not mistaken um, i'm not sure your child has shown any spasticity or when you no, say long no. They're no more hypochronic and floppy, right? Yes, sir. Hmm. And hello to Martin, all the way from the Netherlands. Is that the connective tissue uh, gene? Sorry, sir. The gene, what does it, uh, which spectrum does it come under? AP4 and 1. Okay, um, just get back to us with the final diagnosis once you get it. Actually, a panel of hereditary spastic paraplegia, so it associates okay. So, yeah, so there's no spasticity. Mm. All right, we'll move on to our next case. Jan? Yes, sir. So, I'm presenting a case of trailer. Uh, am I audible, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. 12-year-old boy uh, who came with us uh, with history of headache since two years. The headache was initially bilateral and which uh, spread diffusely over the entire area, which was moderate in intensity and which was associated with nausea, vomiting, photophobia, and which was usually preceded by an aura, which has vision loss or blackening. So these episodes were around three to uh, two to three times per month in frequency, and each episode would last for one to two hours. Uh, on the background, the child had a normal perinatal history, developmental history. However, uh, scholastic performance is low. On examination, uh, the child had a normal general physical, neurological, and systemic examination and had a normal head circumference. But on the examination uh, of the parents, the parent uh, father had uh, a subcutaneous, subcutaneous mass around uh, six to four centimeter, uh, which was on his uh, elbow region uh, with a positive slip, slime, a slip sign, suggestive lipoma. And uh, the head circumference of the child was also normal and the father's head circumference was 56. And the rest of the examination, the father was also normal. So in view of uh, headache uh, since two years, we initially thought it was migraine and uh, we just wanted to rule out any secondary causes. So we got an MRI done. So MI scans, uh, so. Um, so. We have the axial sequences over there and T1, T2 flare, there's a cyst over there in the right, peritrigonal region in the right temporal lobe. Um, doesn't demonstrate any diffusion restriction. Um, so it's demonstrating CSF intensity in all sequences. Uh, some uh, tiny hyper intensities in the superficial white matter in the form of the perivascular spaces more along the parietal region. Again, some uh, tiny, Hyper intensity is some perivascular spaces down there. Um, corpus callosum was commented as thickened, but it uh, doesn't appear to me, at least to me, as thickened the corpus callosum for the age. Uh, no brainstem or cerebellar abnormalities on these earthly images. So, based on that, um, Jen? Yes, sir. So, uh, based on these findings in the examination of the father, which had uh, a lipoma and also a cystic lesion. So we were thinking in lines with prominent perivascular spaces. So we were thinking in lines of Peton. Uh, so can that explain the, the cyst itself can be because of Peton and headache, can it be explained uh, by this entity? So I, I, we wanted to know about that. Okay, just to point out, uh, perivascular spaces in, in general are non-specific findings, but um, in correlation with clinical and other radiological findings uh, can have some differentials. P10, though not always, but it's usually associated with thickened corpus callosum, slightly bulky um, corpus callosum. Um, Neuropetian disorders such as ITO, uh, low syndrome can have prominent perivascular spaces. Manosidosis can have that, and other differentials are listed over here. So I don't think clinically it fits into any. There's, the child is normal syphilis, so photos and uh, such disorders can be probably ruled out. Uh, the cyst, I think, is again non specific. It probably could be a at least to me, a perivascular space or just a benign cyst. So, yeah. Oh, the, yeah. the clinical problem is headaches only, correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, who is sir? Sorry, the queen is dead. Um, we are going to call this a giant perivascular space of the temporal lobe and leave it alone. Is that correct, Nihal? Yeah. It's a very well-defined entity now and do nothing with this. This is not P10. This doesn't look like an emptoropathy. And I don't think there's any overgrowth happening anywhere. Now, the other lesions could be relevant in terms of the migraine that you're describing, but if the headaches are really of migrainous nature. But I think that lesion is a giant perivascular space of the temporal lobe. And actually, if you Google that entity in itself and see pictures, you'll see very similar findings. So summary and conclusion, it's not uh, evidence for P10 because these patients are consistently micro macrocephalic. This is just plain migraine. Yeah? Yes, sir. Well, and um, MRI does not need to be uh, followed up unless there are new points. All right. So, uh, uh, Jane VR space has, has been also mentioned in the literature to be associated with headaches. So if these headaches are persistent, so uh, do we have any surgical or any other intervention which needs to be done if the headaches are recurrent and severe? Nothing. No. Yeah. I'm not, I don't know whether we have a neurosurgeon here, but I would say that don't even bother getting a surgeon involved for this. Okay. There are a lot of papers where migraine has these um, changes in the brain. I mean, 
There are a lot of papers to suggest. Yeah. Tiny white matter genes, but not. Uh. These are, in my view, these are normal variants. So the coincidence of a normal variant, whatever it is, pineal cyst and so on, with migraine is very high. So I'm not really impressed. And I wouldn't call that a thick corpus callosum. I agree with you, Nihal. So um, do we assume uh, that uh, this entity is coincidental with the headache? Do we not? follow the, follow the patient up with the repeat imaging or something no we won't follow them up here at least all right but that's because uk is a new third world we don't have any money to follow these people up all right thank you yes. uh, next case i think is from me Jen, is it from you or yes sir uh, yes, sir i'm presenting hello am yeah, i audible but... Yeah. Okay, sir. So I'm presenting a case of 11 month old female child presented to us with fever and respiratory distress. On the fourth day of admission, patient developed seizure followed by altered sensorium. Perinatal history was une uneventful. However, there was global developmental delay and a history of febrile illness one month back, which needed admission. And uh, there was documented pancytopenia and patient received blood transfusion during uh, that admission. Uh, currently, uh, patient uh, had on examination failure to thrive, hepatosplenomegaly, spasticity, brisk reflexes, and MRI was done as there was altered sensorium and seizure. On investigating, uh, patient had blood, uh, bicytopenia currently, thrombocytopenia and anemia with deranged coagulation profile. And uh, the baby's HIV serology came positive. Uh, and following which we done uh, serology of parents also, which also came positive. And uh, baby's HIV DNA PCR is awaited, but we got done uh, HIV duo culture, uh, which also came positive. Uh, so, so the MRI images. Okay. So Amari, these were, yeah. yeah. Among images, we have bilateral significant subdural collections with some dural thickening over there uh, on both sides. Um, yeah, the collections are of various uh, intensities on the, on the flare images there. T2, again, you have the fluid fluid levels, uh, some hemorrhage components. The basal ganglia demonstrate these patchy hyperintensities, also seen on the flare images. Um, no structural malformations, no other abnormalities in the rest of the brain parenchyma. Cerebellum is um, normal, no signal changes or focal lesions. Again, you can appreciate the bilateral uh, extensive subdural collections, um, heterogeneous in nature. Diffusion weighted sequences, uh, the dura demonstrates uh, predominant uh, restricted, restricted diffusion. Also, the subdural collections have some degree of restricted diffusion over there, predominantly on the posterior aspects. Um, also, you have the parenchyma demonstrating some areas of um, cerebroxic injury in the left frontal region. The basal ganglia also have the, the patchy hyperintensities demonstrate restrictive diffusion, also, and also in along the anterior cingulate cortex uh, region. The SWI images, uh, you have uh, blooming or blood products in the subdural space along the uh, right side, the right posterior space, also in the around the lateral aspects over there. Uh, some foci in the frontal regions. Uh, no parenchymal hemorrhage. Also in the cerebellum and the brainstem, there's no hemorrhagic foci. But yeah, subdural collections are hemorrhagic uh, with um, acute or subacute changes in the brain parenchyma predominantly in the basal ganglia and the frontal regions on the diffusion weighted sequences. Post contrast study, there is predominant dural or pachymeningeal enhancement. Uh, these are the T1, the flare contrast sequences, and you can appreciate uh, confluent areas of pachymeningeal or dural enhancement going down there. Some possibly some degree of leptomeningeal enhancement along the uh, occipital regions, the posterior temporal and occipital regions. Uh, some septations in the subdural collections on the T1 post contrast sequences. Uh, posterior fossa structures do not demonstrate any um, abnormal enhancement pattern. Um, the question was uh, Is it an acquired etiology related to HIV, or should we think of any inborn error of metabolism or any genetic disorders given that there was developmental delay? So these are the differentials for subdural collections um, listed over here. Yeah, so that, that was the clinical question and I'll open the case for panelists.
Look, hericacidurea yeah, is very unlikely in view of the clinical setting, the spasticity, failure to thrive, organomegaly. So I would exclude that. It looks like a primary infective process, right, with the pancytopenia in the background, um, and maybe there is an immune deficiency driver behind it. Please go back to the first slide, Nihal, in terms of how much of the HIV story is relevant here. Because um, what does that mean, HIV serology came back reactive? Uh, sir, HIV uh, serologies, uh, sir, HIV antibody uh, profile came positive, and after that we got an HIV duo culture, which includes HIV antibody plus P twenty four antigen, which also came reactive, sir. But we couldn't do HIV DNA PCR because of financial constraints. Okay, so we are assuming that this is they are immunocompromised from the yes, HIV. Yes, right? yes, yes, sir. Which could be a primary or a secondary process. There could still be another immune deficiency disorder running in the background, right? Yes. With the febrile illness one month back and documented pancytopenia. Yes, sir. This may not be primary HIV, what we're looking at, but this is an infective process for sure. And Nihal will agree that there is some persisting uh, infective process in the form of cerebritis and pus in those subdural collections with the restricted diffusion, et cetera, going on. Um, and it could be bacterial or viral at this point in time. But it's a complex case because of the HIV underlay as well. But there's a lot going for a bacterial superseded infection on top of everything else. Yes, sir. And was this HIV, you think, uh, vertically transmitted then? Yes, so parents also came positive. Okay. For parents at HIV serology. Look hard into the vessels because vasculopathy and uh, HIV encephalopathy would be there in the background somewhere as well in all this. Okay, sir. And me too, once again, don't call anyone, sir. Oh, okay, sir. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Someone asked about the subdural collections to analyze, but for what? I mean, you can. Uh, it'll be a simple procedure to get some of the subdural fluid out, but I don't think it, it's going to change much in okay. terms of how you manage this case, right? Right, right. Nihal, from what you showed of the blood vessels, I did not see any obvious abnormality, but uh, I think we should, baseline, we should baseline the arterial study at least, right, before things get worse. All right. So our next case, uh, Dr. Yeah, so he's a five-month-old baby with uh, who came to me a few weeks back with global delay, but it was more of a uh, motor delay in the sense that uh, he had poor neck holding he couldn't uh, uh, he couldn't use much of his limbs uh, due to the spasticity but he was interacting quite well smiling some noises early babbles so uh, we did uh, mri which will come subsequently and the basis of that we did some investigations which uh, mentioned here um, especially important igg cmv was negative and hearing was normal uh, so we could probably discuss the MRI and then we can go back to the history. Uneventful perinatal period. All right. So this is a five-month uh, MR T2 axon sequences, and you can appreciate there is extensive uh, white matter abnormalities, predominantly along the frontoparietal regions, and there is frontal polymicrobaria, uh, as demonstrated by the arrows over there. Some areas of uh, simplified viral pattern uh, in the super superficial frontal lobes. Um, Diffuse white matter abnormalities. The, there's a greater sparing of the corpus callosum, but again, you can see the genu is again demonstrating some hyperintensity, penum slightly less affected. Um, brainstem is normal, uh, some hyperintensity is in the or delayed malnation in the dorsal pons medulla. Uh, the, the white matter changes do not rarefy on the uh, flare, flare sequences, they again demonstrate hyperintensities. Um, Again, on the coronal images, you can appreciate the gyral pattern, some, possibly some pachygyria going on in the frontal lobes um, bilaterally um, in a background of polymicrogyria. And on the T1 wicked sequences, uh, only the superior aspects, you have these tiny punctate foci along the cortex of particle regions, which on the, which on the CT um, corresponds to calcifications uh, in the bilateral front, frontoparietal regions. 
almost uh, confluent in some areas, but uh, again, multiple punctate areas of primary involvement of subcortical particle regions in the bilateral cerebral hemispheres. They do not uh, demonstrate possibly slightly on the SWA sequences, but more commonly evident or easily evident on the CT scan. I don't have a CT image at the level of the basal ganglia and thalami, but on the SWA sequences, cannot appreciate any areas of blooming out there. So based on that, uh, congenital torch was a possibility. Um, the most common abnormality with white matter abnormalities and particle malformations is CMV, though the calcification is more towards the center than towards the peripheral aspects. Toxoplasmosis uh, commonly presents with peripheral um, areas of calcification, but they usually have ventricomegaly and is macrocephalic with uh, hepatosplenomegaly megaly and poetinitis. Uh, the rest, I don't think Zika is common in India and uh, LCMV, I don't know. Don't think we have polyretinitis and the white matter abnormalities are not common in LCMB. Uh, the other genetic possibility, if we think of, of a non-acquired cause, even the calcifications was OCLN mutation. Uh, though the white matter abnormalities is not commonly described, polymicrogyria and a band-like calcification is demonstrated in OCLN mutation. Uh, this is one of our cases which had some band-like calcification, concurrent calcification on the cortex and subcortical regions. These are other abnormalities with intracranial calcifications. Um, Alcardic is based on the white matter changes, um, and in, they can also present with uh, peripheral areas of calcification, but polymicrogyria is not very common um, seen in Alcardic Gutierrez, though, though there are some cases with focal areas of polymicrogyria, but not, or a pachygyria, but uh, not commonly seen in Alcardic Gutierrez. Uh, so yeah, the differentials were torch infection, IgM, CMV was negative, and uh, some genetic disorders such as OCLN and, and interferonopathies. Now I'll open the case for the panelist comment. So the birth weight was uh, normal. The child was not small for date. The child does not have any organomegaly and torch is negative. So toxo is negative and CMV IgG is negative. Because so IgM is not that important. So IgG is negative. And hearing is normal because the cases of uh, uh, perinatal intrauterine CMV, which I have seen, even if they don't have much of MRI changes, hearing is often affected. So hearing is the first thing to get affected. Even in the milder ones, the bara is mildly abnormal. So that sometimes helps. But here the bara was normal and torch IgG was negative. So this is in favor of a genetic uh, situation like uh, OCLN or another pseudo torch. Uh, disorder. Calcification doesn't look like OCLN and it generally would kind of lie over the malformed cortex anteriorly uh, on a band-like configuration, which I think you had put in a, one of your differentials. So a very different kind of calcification. Uh, early in, in yeah, but in terms of torch in itself, you haven't excluded the other possibilities yet, have you? Uh, which other possibilities? Rubella, herpes. Yeah, so, so torch negative. So toxo, the, rubella. The, the whole... Yeah, so all four are covered. Toxo, okay. rubella, cytomegalus, so, so herpes is negative. IgG is okay. negative for all of them. Because if we talk about pseudo torch, then we are left with things like Ecardi Gutierre. Now, has anyone seen this extent of malformation with Ecardi Gutierre, any of the subtypes? The only one which fits is the OCLN, but uh, in, if the calcifications are in the early stage and might become confirmed later on, that we will not know. Worth excluding for sure, but it's very band like, right? Whenever we have seen it, even your other picture of the OCLN, you know, the second yes. row yes. on that panel next to it, you know, the other eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that, that also, that's more typical, isn't it? And they usually have thalamic calcifications, so we don't have a CD. Dr. Vivek, uh, was there any calcification of thalamus any time? So, no thalamic calcification. So I think, yes. Uh, if the torch is ruled out, then maybe to rule out the genetic. Well, correct me if I'm wrong. Is it possible to completely rule out torch always? or? So, I don't know. Because that's what I was going to is I, because I thought if IgG CMV is negative uh, or rubella, you know, uh, um, I don't know. So I want to ask people: Does it rule out uh, intrauterine perinatally acquired infection? So people to answer. 
so so that was my query as well when i put it in here because it looks very cmv like mri yes the mr and ct are very cmv like and it would be a first trimester gestation uh, insult really at that point in time to cause this degree of malformation so it will be useful to know what other thing if cmv igg is negative and hearing is normal does it rule out because ideally one should uh, do a cmv pcr in the guthrie car at birth because some so if it is positive then you cannot be sure because you can get a postnatal cmv after one month or two months 40 50% of patients can get a asymptomatic cmv so if i had a igg positive cmv that doesn't lead me anywhere because that can happen after birth. But if somebody has a IgG negative CMV at five months, can it become negative? If somebody had a, had infection before birth, can it become negative after four, five months of birth? It was done at five month age. Kavita was asking what age. But I thought if I if once you get a CMV infection, IgG should stay. Uh I don't have the absolute answer, just say that in countries where you have neonatal screening, uh, people go back to the neonatal dried blood uh, spot and do PCR in that spot. But the people who uh, report on this say, even if it's negative, it does not really completely exclude prenatal CMV. It depends on the technique and on the cutoff level. So I think you gain those are patients where if, for example, I had this child and she had CMV IgG positive at five months. Now I won't be sure if it was at birth or after birth. So then I will go back to the Guthrie card and look at the CMV PCR. Uh, and if that is positive, then I know it was antenatal. But here the situation is different, isn't it? Yeah, here the I, IgG have, is I understand. Yeah. So there's a question of mother's thought status. That I have not done. Like... I can do it. Do you think it will help? Because if CMV IgG mother is positive, that she can be. Uh, she could have acquired it at any time after birth. It's not helpful. Yeah. CSF or neopterin? CSF for interferon, is it? I can't go to here. No, no. Done that. So, not done the Terence in CSF. So it's done only in one center. You know, Dr. Jalan does it in Mumbai. And usually terrains, the problem is terrains disappear very quickly from CSF. The half-life is really, really... So whatever samples I've sent from Jaipur to Bombay, even in a, a baby who was not a neurotransmitter disorder in there, terrains were nearly always low. So terrains, if they are to be done, they should be done the same day. So among the neurotransmitter, DOPA can be done after 5-10 days, but terrains will just fall. So, so I'm not sure if it will help in this case if it's not done in my center, CSF terrains. So Kavita, I think it's, uh, yeah, we can, the thing is when a child comes to you in OPD, if we be very practical, you know, so a child comes to me in OPD with developmental delay and spasticity, I cannot, cannot convince them to just get admitted for a CSF <laughs> because which will not give me all the clues, you know, uh, just for a CSF protein. Uh, I would admit him if he's a acquired disorder who comes with autoimmune disorder, but definitely not worth going that far just to admit a child for a CSF who comes to you in OPD with global delay and spasticity may be better to just go ahead and do a genetics if they agree. Because, you know... Yeah, that's what I was going country, to say. It's in our country, to CSF, do exam, doing CSF yeah. is a big thing for the family. I agree, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Because it's looking more genetic rather than CMV, but of course CMV can also look like this. So there will always be a dilemma. So to solve it then, you need more indirect clues or go directly to exome. Yeah, yeah. And of the genetics, then the primary would be OCLN here, isn't it? Or maybe a Cardi Gutier, maybe. Uh, I've never seen it with malformation. Yeah. I might be wrong, but that's. I think the closer one is OCLN rather than. Right. Okay. 
Yeah. Well, you'll end up doing it anyway, so we'll know, but uh, just going with probabilities. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Dr. Rashmi? Uh, hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, so this is um, uh, this is one of the children. Uh, I think Dr. Navid is here as well. He's a PICU consultant who had referred to me this child. So this child was first born of uh, a consanguineous marriage. Parents were first cousins and mother had oligoheteronous. Baby was born by emergency. LSCS was fine after birth. And at two and a half months of age, she had one day of fever and uh, she had continuous... Uh, Generalized tonic-clonic movements, the prolong of the eyes, uh, posturing, uh, deviation of the eyes. And this almost went on for six hours. Uh, and by the time, after they came into hospital, they, give, they were given IV levity recitam and then this result. So initially, we were thinking fever with seizures, UTI, uh, meningitis. So the baby admission urine pustles were six to eight pustles, a little bit more than what we would expect. CSF was completely normal. And uh, then uh, we, uh, Dr. Navid went ahead and did an MRI. We asked for MRI. So he did, did an MRI scan of the brain. So following the MRI, uh, so do you want to discuss the MRI, MRI for first? Yes. or uh, okay. Following the MRI, uh, I started the child on thymine and biotin. Huh? Rashmi, we'll discuss the MRI first. Oh, okay, you discuss the MRI first. Okay. Yeah. So I have only the um, images from the film to slightly pixelated, but you can appreciate that there are... Um, Areas of restricted diffusion symmetrically involving the, the lentiform nucleus on both sides, predominantly the putamen, and some degree on the sphenoid of the corpus callosum. Uh, the mammary body is also demonstrating slightly hyper stains on the DWI. All of these areas correspond to low signals on the ADC, though I have not put them up. Um, again, similar findings on the D2A sequences demonstrating zerimatous changes. The peri the periapodactyl region over there demonstrates uh, T2 hyper intensities. Coming down to the brains, the lower brainstem and the cerebellum, and no abnormalities in the cerebellum though. So primary abnormalities in the dorsal striatum and the periaqueductal regions and also involving the mammary bodies on both sides with the spinae of the corpus callosum. Uh, based on that, the possibilities of uh, biotin thymine was raised, acquired or genetic. Uh, Dr. Uh, Rashmi, you can go ahead. Yeah. So after seeing this MRI, I asked Dr. Navid to start the child on thymine and biotin. Uh, which he did. And then, then I followed up the child. Now I followed up the child for the last, uh, it's June, November, no? So it's almost six months I have followed up this child. So with that, the development was completely normal. Uh, uh, the, the child did extremely well. Uh, so we went ahead and did genetics. And the genetics came back with one irrelevant, uh, maybe an irrelevant mutation. Uh, so then I have stopped the biotin because I, they told me they have a predominant rice-based diet. So I just continued the thymine for now. And I just wanted to know what other, uh, uh people think. Um, so the genetic came up with ITPA, heterozygous, and yeah. the typical imaging features of ITPA, the predominant involved the pyramidal tracts, some of the global paradigm and the brainstem, but are not similar to our, uh, at least our imaging of the index study. So I think ITPA could, can be ruled out based on the imaging itself. Yeah, and also it's heterozygous, no? ITPA, it's come as heterozygous. Yeah. So it's not, and it's meant to be an autosomal recessive yes. uh, mutation. So, uh, yeah, and, and mitochondrial was negative. So, um, so yeah, so I presumed it was like nutritional thymine deficiency. I think you put up a slide earlier because mm -hmm. nothing came uh -huh. up and I thought maybe that's what made the difference that this child did extremely well after that. Uh, yeah, this is from one of our cases uh, I think published last year. It has a similar imaging pattern though. More oh, it has a similar imaging pattern, no? More yeah. cerebral involvement, but the common uh, findings were mammary body involvement, uh, involvement of the dorsal striatum, periaqueductal region. The cortex also can be involved. So some imaging uh -huh. match your case. So it could, it, this could match. So then, uh, yeah, when I discussed with them, they were, yeah, the mother said that she uh, ate a predominant rice-based diet. She was not willing to eat anything else. And the grandfather also eats only rice. So the mother-in-law was complaining about them that they don't have it. They don't want to eat anything else and all that. So I, I have continued the thymine and I've stopped the biotin. Um, you could also look at the uh, blood picture because hemoglobin is 9.6. So they also get a macrocytic anemia. So just out of interest, whether there was uh, macrocytosis, you know, MCV 
Oh, no, no, MCV, MCV was low because I started the child on iron supplements. Okay. okay. Tonoferon drops I had started. MCV was on low. I don't remember the exact value, but it was low. So thymine, uh, no, sorry. It causes microcytic anemia. So, oh, probably it is micro, not macro. So I have to check, but it is it is not normochromic. Oh, okay. There is something. Sorry. Uh -huh. It might be microcytic. So, or might so, be microcytic. Okay. Yeah. Maybe because there's deficiency, because if they're eating rice, they will be deficient in many other... Uh, uh, right. Many other things, right? If they're eating only rice, yeah, uh, yeah, that that could also be the reason why they might have uh, microcytic anemia. Is a follow up MRI available? No, I haven't done a follow up MRI, Doctor Eugene. Uh, do you think it would be helpful? Well, if you consider a mitochondrial disorder, which you did obviously, uh, it could uh, maybe assist in your decision. Uh, mitochondrial ge genetics is negative. Well, the mitochondrial the, genome is negative. The yield, the yield of this test is uh, maximum 70%. So this would not oh. really exclude it. Okay, okay, okay. So if we do follow up MRI, when would be the best time to do it? Now. Now, six months down the line. Yeah. So if, if everything is resolved, then we can assume it's because of the thymine. Not, not everything. If it's not progressed or if it's slightly come down, I do. Oh, okay. Is the corpus callosum thin? Uh, uh, what age was it done, Dr. Krishna? Two and a half months. Uh, for two and a half months, I think it should be okay. Sorry? Uh, for two and a half months, I think that should be fine. Um, so the image is slightly fixated. But, uh... Okay, the next time they come, I will talk to them about the repeat uh, MRI brain scan. Uh, okay. Um, if there are no other comments, we'll move on to our next case. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Neil. Um, sorry, I think that's uh, Pritija. Sorry, who's present in this case? Uh, so, me. Okay, the problem. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, this is a two year, six month old female child, born of third degree consanguineous marriage. Uh, antenatally, uh, at 32 weeks, uh, she was detected to have prominent ventricles. Uh, birth history was normal, child cried immediately after birth. Uh, birth weight was uh, appropriate for gestation age. Uh, child had neonatal seizures uh, starting at day two of life. Now presented to us with severe developmental delay, microcephaly. Uh, there was cerebral visual impairment, there was no uh, tracking. And refractory epilepsy, uh, these are polymorphic seizures, multifocal uh, clonic seizures, uh, occurring multiple times a day. So, antenatal detected prominent ventricles, anything in the pregnancy to... Uh, no to history of fevers or no uh, any uh, antenatal history, so significant. Uh, again, slightly... Um... We have only images from the films, and on the top we have axial images. We have a posterior dominant lateral ventricle, lateral ventricle or dilatation. Um, cannot really appreciate the cortex, but it at what age was this done? Uh, scan. Two years. Uh, two okay, years so, of age. Okay, so two years. Um, yeah, the cortex is uh, possibly simplified over there. Um, not can, cannot really make it out on the flare images, but yeah, there's dilatation on the ventricles, which is. Uh, evident on the flare sequences. Um, the coronal uh, sequences again demonstrate the gravel pattern is not uh, well formed. It's, it's simplified or uh, it's not thickened, but it is simplified in nature. Again, posterior dominant ventricomegaly. There was a possible uh, query raised of diencephalic and encephalic junction dysplasia uh, demonstrating this appearance over there, but you don't have the slice thickness or the uh, sequence of images. So there can be a possibility over there. Um, again, simplified gradual pattern, possibly some areas of microgaria or polymicrogaria, but the images are not um, very clear for that. Um, on the SWS sequences, some areas of hemorrhage along the ventricles and the periventricular regions. So probably define it as uh, simplified gradual pattern, the moderate to severe phenotype. Uh, these are the literature examples of diencephalic mesencephalic junction dysplasia. Uh, they usually have a thickened uh, junction over there from the thalamus to the midbrain. And they're commonly associated with the uh, ventricomegaly due to the, uh, the atrophy of the adjacent white matter or the volume loss. 
So the question was, uh, does this child have particle uh, malformation or microgyria? I'm not sure if you use microgyria as a terminology, but the cortex is uh, definitely abnormal for this age. And I'll open the case for the panelists. Yes, Ashish. Yeah, I have nothing to add. In addition, I thought uh, without uh, criticizing, the, the quality is really uh, not sufficient to, to give any detail. I don't understand also the anatomy of the cerebellum. Is there any structure in the cerebellum? It looks like a, just, just like a big mass. Uh, I think another high quality image would be helpful in better delineating the situation. I have also considered the diencephalic mesencephalic junction dysplasia, but the details you can't see. All right, Devangna, maybe you can uh, ask them to get a follow-up scan. Uh, yeah, sure. So if we're thinking DMJD, uh, you can do an L1 cam exclusion early on, right? I think you're right about the DMJD situation. Yeah. I don't know about WDR81, Martin. Does that cause uh, DMJD as well? Protocadrin 12 also causes DMJD. So. There are two or three uh, genes, but uh, particularly L1 cam would be an early exclusion with this degree of ventriculomegaly, right? Bonafide, there are only five genes that cause human hydrocephalus congenitally, of which there's one L1 cam, and that gives you the diencephalic mesencephalic. Protocadrin 12, PD12 is in that panel as well. Yes, you're right. I really can't comment upon the corpus callosum, but maybe over here, or you can probably see some- There's uh, a bit of corpus callosum, as you can see. All right, Devana, maybe better to get a follow-up scan, the better imaging. <clears throat> Okay, my next case. Yes, sir. Two years, eight months old uh, female child presented with developmental delay, facial dysmorphism, high myopia, short stature, normal cephaly with open uh, anterior fontanel. She had a short stature of height less than third centile. This morphism, there were bilateral epicans exposed, mild upwards planting of eyes and depressed nasal bridge. She had bilateral isotropia, more on the right than on the left, with bilateral foot eversion and curling of the toes was present. No neurocutaneous marker, normal dermatographics, normal gait was present. So we've done uh, investigations. Yeah, when we'll go to the MR. Okay. Sorry, yeah, okay, you can go ahead with the yeah. Uh, so, higher function test was normal, TMS was normal, auditory brainstem response was normal, vision showed right eye of minus three diopters and left eye of high myopia of minus seven diopters. X ray of 32 months old showed the current bone age to be of 18 months, so there was delayed bone age. Serum alkaline phosphate was uh, 157, vitamin D level was 11.3 nanogram per milliliter, and that was lower than the normal range of normal range being 20 to 40. Serum uh, parathyroid level was 348 picogram per milliliter, that was slightly on the higher side, and serum CP level was 401. Then we did an MRI scan. Just for the radiologist, which levels are normal, which are abnormal, because you just uh, read out the findings. Serum CPK elevated? Uh, serum CPK is elevated, sir. BTS. Alkaline phosphatase is slightly elevated. Vitamin D level is low. Uh, 20 to 40 is the normal range in nanogram per milliliter. Serum thyroid level is elevated. A normal range given in picogram is 10 to 55. Thank you. So, yeah. At what age was MR done? Two years, four months, sir. So we have axial images. You can appreciate uh, confluent white matter abnormalities, uh, periventricular deep, sub 
almost extending up to the subcortical regions, some areas of subcortical spreading in the parietal regions. Um, the cortex in the frontal lobes uh, demonstrates slight abnormality, possible as minor polymicrogaria in comparison to the parietal region where the cortex is normal. Uh, there is sparing of the corpus callosum and uh, the central white matter, patchy area of involvement of the anterior basal ganglia, a mild ventricular prominence. Coming down below, there is a vertical cleft along the vermis, though not dysplastic, but there's a, there's a clefting or there's a median clefting. Um, the corpus callosum is reduced in size or hypoplastic. The brainstem is a dysmorphic and hypoplastic. Uh, vermis is also reduced in height. Flare images, no refractory changes or cavitations. Again, confluent white matter abnormalities uh, involving the bilateral hemispheres with sparing of the corpus callosum and the internal capsules. Um, cerebellum, we have these tiny cystic areas, um, possibly on the left, involving the parenchyma, but um, was not sure if it going along the foliar space of the fissures or the parenchyma. On the right side, again, we have the cystic foci. They are, looks, appear to be along the fissure or the folia, but I'm not able to say if it's in the parenchyma or in the folia. Um, SWS sequences did not pick up any calcification on hemorrhage, and no abnormalities on the diffusion weight sequences, a slightly myopic appearance of the bilateral lobes. Uh, so this is a chart for the um, pattern approach for white matter disorders. Our patient comes under cerebral, diffuse cerebral or pedimentical predominant related disorders and um, we consider the frontal lobe changes as uh, of malformed areas, uh, muscular dystrophy is, is common, uh, but the child clinically was not hypotonic, so obviously very hypotonic or uh, so. Paroxysmal disorders was another consideration. Um, cerebral assist, these are the differentials that can kind of paper from Eigen. Um, MDC1 was thought of, um, it had similar white matter changes cannot be associated with uh, malformation of the cortex predominantly on the posterior regions, but also can be seen in the anterior aspects. Um, creatine kinase uh, uh, was elevated, so I'm not sure if it fits into a LAMA2, but Prithuja will probably give us the answer later on. Um, these were the, yeah, Prithuja, you can go ahead. So, uh, genetic test was done and uh, there was two mutations that were seen, both of heterozygous mutation. And uh, the, these mutations were of variant of uncertain significance with uh, no, no any phenotype correlation was there. Even reanalysis uh, showed the same mutation with no significance. This is just an example of the SPTAN1. Uh, they usually present with diffuse atrophy of the brain, they are in epileptic syndrome, so it doesn't fit into our imaging pattern. And Paul 3, uh, the imaging feature is not typical of a Paul 3. Yeah, so I'll open the case for any further um, uh, differentials and comments. Are there some cysts in the cerebellum on the left side? Cystic yeah, they're on both sides. Um, both sides. So it's very, uh, you know, this is clinically and with the neuroimaging suggestive of a congenital muscular dystrophy with a slightly raised CPK, which can only be mildly raised sometimes. Uh, PTH high is probably because of the vitamin D deficiency. So that is just secondary hyperparia. So that's not important here. Uh, could you tell me if the knee jerks were present or absent? Because what I have realized in these patients, it's a very useful way uh, tool because if it is a, it's a CNS disease and not muscular dystrophy, knee jerks are brisk. But what I have seen in all my congenital muscular dystrophy patients, their knee jerks are absent and ankle jerks are present, which is not there in any other CNS cause. So if it is a congenital muscular dystrophy, knee jerks will be absent, ankle jerks will be present, CPK will be mildly raised, and you will have this MRI. I agree. So with the knee was Sorry? The knee jerk was elicitable, so not brisk. Not brisk is also important because absent to just elicitable while ankle jerks are really easily elicited. So that's just an observation because this looks very. Okay. I don't have a definite conclusion, but I agree with Nihal. It's problematic whether the cis cerebellar cysts are actually in the cerebellar parenchyma or they lie in a row in a semicircle away. They, it looks to me they are in a fissure. And uh, this is not what you see in CMD or in LAMA1. 
and uh, Martin has raised the question of Noonan, but if I remember correctly your paper, the Noonan cysts were very peripheral subcortical. It's a comment that in any muscular dystrophy, ankle jumps is last to disappear, including DMD. Yeah, that's true. So that's why it's important because if it's a muscular dystrophy, ankle jerks are so well elicited, knee jerks absent to just elicited. While if it is not a neuromuscular involvement in a child with such a diffuse uh, brain involvement, both knee and ankle jerks will be brisk. So it's just a clinical way to differentiate. I'm not sure whether this argument is valid in general terms. Um, don't take me wrong, but if you just look at a very, ex very extensive white matter involvement, not particularly in this patient, like in mitochondrial neurogastrointestinal encephalopathy, you have a normal peripheral nervous system, usually, and reflexes. Should it be considered as a CMD? Uh, yeah, the question is this. How do we go ahead to the muscle biopsy since the genetics does not pick up anything? This is unlikely a structural myopathy. But you need to ask. Uh, we haven't planned for the muscle biopsy. Should we go ahead to the muscle biopsy or not? That is a question. Because again, a biopsy is an investment. Invasive procedure, so. The CTK level was just uh, on the borderline higher range, so maybe we'll repeat that and plan on the muscle biopsy on the basis of the MRI scan. And did you say the child is hypotonic or hypertonic? Is spasticity or hypotonia? Frog posture or hypertonic? Uh, not hypertonic. No, that doesn't help. Not hypertonic doesn't help. My hypotonia. Not, uh, my hypotonia. Hypotonic. Hypotonic. Yeah. Yeah. So he has less tone. He's floppy. Yes, yes. Mm, very odd for a significant white matter changes with a, just a CNS disorder to be floppy. Uh, what would be the next step? Any Pitocha, anything? Did Dr. Lokesh say anything about so it? Just... No. Well, no, we're just planning to follow up the child, but the muscle actually was not planned. Uh, okay. We might have to repeat the CT level once and plan on the five sheets after we see the child. If this turns out to be mitochondrial, um, you do have the additional finding of a possible cortical malformation here, correct? Correct. Yeah, but the corpus callosum is really spared. That was the only thing. Um, but yeah, can be a mitochondrial nuclear DNA sort of. Corpus callosum is spared, you said. I mean, it's relatively spared. They're really the middle blade is more commonly involved in these uh, mitochondrial lipodystrophy type pattern. Not well, all. Yeah. Quite a lot of that corpus callosum is involved, I think. Yeah. At least on the fifth picture that you're showing. No, the screen is involved, yeah. I mean, anteriorly as well, there are patchy changes, but I don't think that's a very hard sign either way. I mean, it's white matter, yeah. and with so much white matter involvement, the corpus callosum will be patchily involved, anyways. I think yeah. people are asking about CK and stuff. I don't know how, how strongly the CK was raised because that's a very important clinical handle, right? In these cases, it's only mildly elevated, I think. Um, it's not like what we would have typically seen in dystrophic range. Okay. In yeah. congenital muscular dystrophy, you don't see it in the dystrophin range. You see it maybe up to 1,000, 
not more than that not more than that. 410 is low but uh, you don't see it in 10000s you just see it in 1200 900 800 and did we do enough right. conduction because if it's mitochondrial sometimes if there's a neuropathy with the cns involvement of hypotonia nerve conduction can help oh we haven't done it no conduction is not because done. you have a child who is hypotonic who doesn't have brisk reflexes so there is a degree of neuromuscular involvement so ncv might help because if we think this could be a mitochondrial disorder if there is an element of peripheral neuropathy it might knit in because the child is not spastic in spite of this mri I'm not sure, Dr. Nihal. Uh, can these changes be consistent with CDG or? Uh... Um, you mean this are, no, no, the cerebellum, they should be atrophy and they're usually hyperintense on the uh, flare sequences. Um, not only that, this degree of leukodystrophy upstream is, uh, is unusual for mm -hmm. CDG, but okay. CDG can do different things. I mean, yeah. But not high on this, as, at least on the MI. Sure. It's, it is looking quite mitochondrial, right? According to the description, this child had uh, facial dysmorphism, short stature, and perhaps other things could be uh, a kind of syndrome in the broad sense. Has a good clinical geneticist had a look at this patient? You may have uh, just normal karyotype or an array to not to miss any translocation. We had a, a genesis seen, sir, and then a, a reanalysis was suggested, and the reanalysis also showed variant of unknown significance, and they haven't come for follow up. The follow up is scheduled for next one, sir. So Murf, Nihal, Murf, does it present with such MRI changes because the short stretcher, mild CPK, uh, you know, and that won't be picked up on nuclear DNA. You have to do a mitochondrial DNA, which I don't think has been done. Murf. And they have short stretcher with mildly raised CPK. So I don't know if the MRI changes similar I've seen in Murf. Not sure of the significant white matter changes. I mean, the leukodystrophy pattern Right. But uh, mitochondrial DNA still is to be done, right? Nuclear DNA has been done for mitochondrial disorders. So the mitochondrial causes of mitochondrial disorders could be done. Or one could do a MRS. Will that help in that area? Uh, yeah, I think this was an external scan. So maybe you can just repeat only for the MRS. CSF lactate, was it done any times? Because of CSF, CSF lactate. Not done. Um, okay, we'll probably evaluate for mitochondrial uh, DNA genes as Dr. Vivek and others have, Dr. Mangal has commented upon. We possibly get a spectroscopy done. Okay. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Okay, next case, Pituja uh, Debanga. Uh, next case is a nine months old female child who presented with spasm since birth. Um, the spasm was very frequent and it uh, increased since last seven years prior to presentation to us. Uh, born to a consanguineous marriage with history of birth asphyxia uh, with a neonatal seizure on second day of life and was treated with some medication. There was a uh, uh, no, my uh, milestones was achieved. No neck holding, only queen was present. No social smile and not reaching out to object. Excessive irritability was present. And or an examination, there was microcephaly with a circumference of 38 centimeter. Poor tracking, light perception was there. Obvious preference was there. And hamstring spasticity with significant head lag was present. EEG was done, which showed multifocal uh, spike and wave discharges with diffuse. Slowing was present. MRI scan was done. So clinically, does it look like a acquired or genetic um, before you go to MR? Well, that is the question of whether this 
the feature that is shown is the acquired or genetic or genetic. Okay, so nothing, no clinical handles for that. All right. Um, okay, we have the MR, and you can appreciate extensive uh, atrophy of the supratentral structures. The predominantly along the peripheral regions, the gray matter, and also the white matter demonstrates uh, extensive areas of valerian degeneration, cortical thinning. Uh, Thalami also demonstrates thalamic degeneration on both sides. Uh, but what you can appreciate, uh, more, it's more conspicuous, is the basal ganglia is bulky. And it does, is slightly T2 hypo intense, it's homogeneously T2 hypo intense. Uh, the rest of the structures are demonstrate volume loss because of the significant atrophy. You can see on the frail images, there are some subdural collections along the temp temporal occipital regions over there on the right side. Uh, CSS spaces are widened in some subdurals over there in the frontal region. So, diffuse volume loss predominantly of the particle regions and also some valerian degeneration of the white matter. And this conspicuous abnormality or sparing of the basal ganglia, which is bulky and homogeneous CT2 hypointense. Cerebellum, again, the brainstem fibers, they've demonstrated these hyperintense changes. And the cerebellum also has um, T2 hyperintensities uniformly on both sides. Um, coronal images, again, you can appreciate the basal ganglia, the hypointensities. I mean, you homogeneous hypointensity with greater sparing in terms of the high signal changes. Uh, again, atrophy of the supra and infratentral structures, corpus closure is reduced, the, the vermis is reduced in height, uh, and also demonstrating this volume loss. On the T1 variant images, the corresponding um, basal ganglia does not demonstrate any hyperintensities or significant hyperintensities in comparison to the T2 changes, and no mineralization or blooming on the SWI sequences. Um, there is a history of uh, hypoxic ischemic injury, but what we thought uh, was it resembled one of our cases. It has almost a similar presentation. And you can appreciate there is diffuse volume loss, particle and white matter changes, but the deep brain nuclei, particularly the basal ganglia, is homogeneous and hypointense, some degree in the midbrain. This turned out to be a trapopathy or trap C4 mutation. Um, they commonly have diffuse extensive volume loss, but there's preservation of the deep brain structures. Again, literature examples. Um, of extensive volume loss, but again, the basal ganglia is predominantly hypointense and slightly bulky. Thalamus can demonstrate hyperintensities and th thalamic degeneration, but the finding of um, the basal ganglia changes was uh, pretty similar to our case. The other differentials um, to be thought of were the mitochondrial disorders, uh, tRNA disorders, and the, the other lysosomal disorders slightly unlikely, um, given the imaging findings to not completely match them. Biotinase deficiency also can have these dark. Um, basic ganglia and thalamic changes. The only points were uh, the child was had a history of hypoxic ischemic injury, but even the degree of volume loss and sparing of the basal ganglia and involvement of the cerebellum, it appeared to be at least to, on the imaging wise, uh, to be slightly atypical for a only a hypoxic ischemic injury sequelae. Um, so yeah, I'll open the case um, for the others to comment upon. And there was consanguinity, so yeah, that was again one more possible feature for a genetic test. Um, you're, yeah. you're suggesting to proceed to genetic testing for TRAP C4. Not specifically, but yeah, TRAP C4 is one of the possibilities. I mean, one of the things uh, one of my colleague radiologists had told me to differentiate between HIE. You correct me if I'm wrong. HIE and a uh, genetic disorder is that the ventricles will be more irregular uh, in size because it's HIE scarring and things like that. Whereas in a genetic disorder, they're more smooth, which is what is in this case. Um, yeah. Because of the periventricular glyosis, yeah, possibly. This is more uniform uh, changes on both sides. So. Yeah, more uniform changes and more smooth rather than having any uh, irregularities. In the shape. More scalloped in appearance. Oh, huh, correct. That's, That's what more I was of a, Yeah, more in the preterms, but can be seen in severe term injury. 
Yeah. The marked cerebellar atrophy is also uh, something which is not consistent in HIE and is perhaps rather uh, in favor of a genetic origin. But it's, it's not black and white, I think. Teacher, what's the plan? Uh, how are we uh, following the patient? Uh, I think we plan to do a genetic testing. Okay. Uh, but it came with the MRI report and follow up as you can tell. They are from Somalia. Genetic mm -hmm. testing is a bit, they're not sure. They're, like reluctant to do it. We've counseled them. To. Okay. Thanks. Next year, sweetie. Okay. Hold on to this one. Dr. Vivida, uh, Dr. Vivida, are you there? She spent a lot of time <laughs> waiting for the presentation. I can see her on the panelist, but yeah, she's there on the panelist now. Yeah. Dr. Vivida? Okay, maybe Dr. Ashmi can go ahead because okay. you have time. Okay, fine. So this is a five month old baby who had uh, fever and seizures and then uh, uh, was taken to the, their clinic and then following that went to a hospital, was uh, thought to have uh, meningitis. Oh, Vivida, yes, uh, she's there. She's asking if she's not audible. Uh, Dr. Vivida, you're not audible. Can you present? She's just sent a message. Yeah, her mic is on though. I mean, nothing from her side. Your mic is on, no? Uh, Please signal. Dr. Vivida, are you... Uh, have you muted yourself? No, she's unmuted only. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ashmi, yeah. maybe... Okay, can... yeah. So... Oh, uh, she's got some pictures here of some birthmarks which are there, hypopigmented birthmarks, which is beside the, the thing. You can uh, go ahead to the next slide. Okay, we have the image there. So, so this was the initial MRI done. Okay. Uh, the first MRI which was done. Uh, you want to go ahead with the findings, Dr. Nihal? This is at uh, the neonatal mm. stage, if I'm not mistaken. Mm? Yeah, this was on the day three of illness. So this was done on the third day of the illness. Yeah, so multifocal... Uh, um, areas of restricted diffusion in the basal ganglia, the periventricular white matter, uh, temporal lobes over there. Um, so areas of possibly small vessel uh, ischemic or changes secondary to the infective process going on. And you can see that um, diffuse leptomeningeal and pachymeningeal enhancement uh, in the bilateral cerebellum SPS. Um, I'm not able to make sure, make out if there is a subdural or there, but yeah, there is some prominence of the sub extradural space along the frontal convexities. Doesn't really show up. Possibly or some areas of high signal on the DWI, but uh, the images are not of um, great quality down up, you know, up there. So that I think uh, bacterial infection was primarily thought of, and uh, uh, trust me. Yeah. yeah. So the, this was done in the referring hospital. So they also did a CSF analysis, which showed two fifty cells, high protein and low sugar, and on the day. Day seven of illness, because of lots of seizures and post sensorium, they were shifted uh, to our hospital. Initially, he was ventilated for two days days and then extubated to um, high frequency ventilation. Initial EG was encephalopathy. And then uh, following that, the baby had, uh, we had to use multiple anticonvulsants for seizures. And then the repeat EG had shown uh, some slow waves in bilateral temporohospital regions. So we needed almost IV levetiristam, phosphonetoin, valproate. And then we changed the phosphonetoin to oxcarbamazepine uh, to control the seizures. We got the CSF from the sample uh, from the refereeing hospital and we tested it for PCR for pneumococcus because the baby had only two doses of pneumococcal vaccine and it was positive. 
Um, the, the baby was quite chubby, as you saw the first picture. So it was very difficult to get lines. So the baby had a femoral line to give the antibiotics. And on day 17, the baby had recurrent fever spikes, um, which initially we thought, could it be because of the exacerbation of the meningitis itself complication or whether it is a line infection? Uh, we did a CT scan around that time, CT brain, and uh, that did not show any subdural collection. So then we, um, uh, the team removed the line and they sent it off for culture. And we had a line infection, uh, Barcholdria. Uh, so we upgraded the antibiotics to meropenem, vancomycin, and uh, keftazidine. So we have given uh, treatment for the Barcholdria now. And we have also given three weeks of IV antibiotics for the pneumococcus. Uh, uh, the seizures are now well controlled. Baby is uh, um, uh, clinically uh, not had fever spikes for uh, the last uh, week. So we thought we would do an um, MRI uh, before we uh, going to stop the antibiotics. So we did this MRI, but obviously after this MRI, we have not stopped the antibiotics. So I think Dr. Nihal will uh, tell us about this repeat MRI. Is this, um, the did you put that CT uh, or that mm -hmm. didn't have a lot now? So. Yeah, the MR would be more. Yeah, clear. MR, yeah. So this is the latest MR. Yeah, so you, again, you have subdural collections some areas of high signals around the uh, subdural space around the bilateral frontal conduxities, more prominently over there, possibly a particle vein which has thrombos, uh, which has thrombos, but yeah, there are some areas of high signals in your DWI. Again, the anterior temporal region, you can appreciate the subdural collection demonstrating restrictive diffusion. Um, and coming higher, higher up, you can appreciate the bilateral subdural collections, areas of cystic encephalomalacia with gliosis in the bilateral parietal regions, extending up to the periventricular white matter. Again, extensive subdural collections uh, in the bilateral cerebral convexities. Uh, some areas of restricted diffusion uh, in the frontal regions and the anterior temporal region. Um, other than the cystic encephalomalacic changes, uh, no acute cha abnormalities in the site. Uh, the spinium again has uh, some areas of high uh, restricted diffusion, and possibly in the bilateral thalami. These areas, though the images are slightly pixelated, um, they look abnormal on both sides. Uh, post contrast uh, flare sequences, and you can appreciate pachymeningeal uh, extensive confluent areas of pachymeningeal enhancement. Um, no enhancement in the uh, brain parenchyma itself. Uh, these were hyper intense on flare, so these are not actually enhancing foci. Uh, corpus closum is reduced in volume. Um, yeah, so the primary changes are bilateral subdural collections with some areas having thin um, areas of restricted diffusion, possibly of hypotenacious content over there, uh, cystic encephalomalacia changes in the bilateral parietal lobes and uh, extensive dural enhancement. So yeah, Dr. Ashmi, you wanted to? Uh, yes, so I wanted to know, like, you know, there are very thin subdural collections. So we probably have to give a long course of antibiotics, maybe, uh, I don't know, I was thinking maybe four weeks or something like that. I don't know what uh, others think. I wouldn't turn it as thin. I mean, um, mm. this, oh, yeah, this is all subdural. Yeah. Um, yeah. So thin. Where, areas, where? Where? Show me that again. Is, uh, over there. Can you see the arrow? No, we can. Next to the cystic areas, the bilateral, uh, the iso intense, slightly iso intense areas. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. This one here, the iso intense areas. Okay. Yeah, on both sides, they are. I mean, not thin. I think pretty significant. So. I wouldn't call them as thin uh, areas, especially so pretty, pretty, pretty thin, thin uh, pretty uh, significant subdural empyemas. Yeah, not significantly causing mass effect, but mm. but yeah, they are significant. I wouldn't call them as thin. Would we so need should surgical? Empyema, uh, should empyema not cause diffusion restriction? Is that right? Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. So there is no diffusion restriction. So it's not empyema. Uh, there are some areas. You see no, but the, the place, yeah. you know, the subdurals, uh, there, there is no, no, there is just like there is no diffusion restriction. Is there a diffusion restriction? There's more subdural collection, effusion, is it, or empyema? And there's no contrast enhancement in the wall. Is it? So this is the post contrast, subdural so enhancement. Um, yeah, but the typical uh, peripheral enhancing foci are not there, the subdural. The, Parietal, parietal subdural connection, but the only areas were over here, the anterior temporal lobe and the frontal regions, which are slightly brighter. So very thin diffusion. Yeah. That's just the, that might not even be the effusion. That might just be the lining of the dura. Awesome. dura. 
Because I think uh, part of the question you might be asking whether one needs to evacuate it as well. Rashmi. Ah, uh, this... yes, yes. That is one of my questions as well. Yeah, Thanks, that's Dr. what Vivek. I think she's yeah. wanting to know whether mm -hmm. one should uh, uh, evacuate. But it doesn't look like an uh, empyema. It's just mm -hmm. the wall which is hyperintense. Is that right, Neha? It's yeah. not like a collection of pus in, outside the brain. That's not there. But the significant uh, subdurals don't uh, restrict. So, yeah, it's not. So okay. I recently had a pneumococcal meningitis baby who was one month old mm -hmm. and again had similar subject we discussed in this meeting long back and mm -hmm. just the wall was enhancing and mm -hmm. uh, we gave uh, four weeks of IV antibiotic and I was very anxious. I did a MRI again mm -hmm. and there was enhancement still. So I mm -hmm. uh, gave them two more weeks and uh, at two months I did a MRI and there was still some enhancement and I told the family that we should uh, uh, take out the CSF and do something about it because it's not improving, but family didn't agree with me. Mm. And they just uh, left because they thought, I don't know what I'm saying. So, mm. so they came back after a month, mm. so around three, four month age, and we did an MRI. It was uh, all enhancement at disappeared. So we don't need to chase that. I think the enhancement takes longer time than the actual recovery. So I think once one has given four weeks of antibiotic, there is no use doing repeated MRIs too frequently because I think this enhancement takes two, three months to go away. So we uh, should. I see. That's very helpful, uh, Dr. Vivek. Yeah. So we can give four weeks of antibiotics. Four weeks we should give definitely. Uh, and you can yeah. stretch to six if the cannula is still there. But no, you've got a central line now. Yeah, so somewhere for whatever is possible, at least four weeks. Hmm. But I won't do too many MRIs because oh. we will be anxious hmm. because the announcement will take few months to go away. Nehal, is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I've spoken, Doctor Rashmi. Again, I said the clinical maybe it's more. Um, we usually don't do multiple follow-ups or frequent follow-ups for infection. Yeah. Hmm. So we can aim to give them four weeks of IV antibiotics, then take the central line out, send them back, and then maybe in a couple of months we can repeat the MRI. Correct. Yeah, because of the baby think, clinically in the meantime. Yeah, we are lucky there is no ventriculitis because that would have uh -huh. been a problem. So there's no ventriculitis. That's why one can probably give four weeks, hold tight, and few months later do a MRI unless, uh -huh. you know, because there is, so I don't think there is a subdural empyema which needs to be evacuated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I feel, but I'll be more than happy what others feel about it. So this is just something which I... Yeah, I'll agree with you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because subdural um, effusion is quite common with uh, meningitis, no? because we don't uh, follow it up. Like many children with meningitis have subdural effusion. And that's also because the left side of brain is atrophied now. It's like huh. there is a collection more of a effusion because of that atrophy. Huh, that is also, you're absolutely right, because there is scarring there. And uh, yeah. so there's atrophy and scarring. So that uh, has filled up with the uh, space. Um. There is a lot of uh, comments here. Uh, yeah, I'll respond. To I think they you you respond. A million dollar question remains whether the subdural collection is a hidden nidus of pathogen. It's a million dollar question. Yeah, obviously it is. <laughs> the pathogen is not hidden. It is obvious. So. <laughs> okay, so multiple scan, I mean scan follow up scans are not required unless there is deterioration and. Uh, Four weeks antibiotics, of course. Yeah, four four weeks of IV antibiotics, and then uh, we won't do the follow up scans and follow up the baby clinically. Hmm? Oh, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, so we have uh, yeah, that's it for our new cases. We have two follow up cases. Thank uh, you very much. Yeah. Thanks. So this was a case discussed in April twenty uh, second. Uh, this was a child of six month child with global development delay. Epilepsy had spasms, clonic seizures vision impairment and microcephaly. There was no history of birth asphyxia and metal history, metal history had three abortions in the first trimester. These are the uh, images, if anyone wants to comment upon the diagnosis. Um, significant white matter loss, some, some also some gray matter loss, uh, periventricular reduction in white matter volume, dysmorphic or lateral ventricles, hyperintense atrophic basal ganglia, uh, reduced in volume of the barotalomai. The midbrain has a typical uh, figure appearance, um, cerebellar hypoplasia pattern, no intracranial calcifications or hemocytrine deposits.
if anyone in the chat wants to mention um, possible diagnosis, uh, HIE mimicker or PVR mimicker. Okay, um, I'll go in. So that time we thought a possibility of PCH9 AMP D2 mutation as one of the uh, strong possibilities based on the imaging and given the abortions in the child, I mean the mother. Um, so it has a typical figure of eight appearance with the supratendral changes resembling a PVL type pattern. And this is the genetics. Um, we had an AMPV2 mutation in the child and the parents tested heterozygous uh, uh, and were asymptomatic. So Dr. Nikit or Dr. Vivek is that, uh, or, or Dr. Aigan is that pathognomic, the genetics uh, or pathogenic, can we consider that pathogenic? This is this this looks very this is pathogenic with okay. the MRI changes and the <clears throat> and the so homozygous with compound heterozygous is it? compound heterozygous yeah, compound, yeah. yeah so it's pathogenic with the clinical context okay all right thank you and uh, a case we discussed yes uh, last last session uh, a fourteen year old boy I mean Dr Eric do you want to this go ahead is a He's a boy who was normal till, till 11 years age. Then he had frequent focal seizures, uh, sort of one to two seizures every day, uh, which was still ongoing. I just did a follow-up today morning and his seizures have now stopped for last one month since the last visit on oxcarbamazepine. But uh, over the last three years, he has uh, regressed slightly cognitively, uh, though, though that is not... Uh, obvious when you talk to him, it's only when you do a mini mental state examination, it becomes obvious. But more important, he has a ataxic spastic gait and uh, uh, with hyperreflexia. He had uh, MRI changes, uh, 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 which were more posterior periventricular and hyperintensities. So at the time, the discussion was, is this Paul G, is this uh, homocysteine-related disorder? Um, and we did homocysteine, which has come very high. So, so more than 50, it's high, basically. Uh, above 50, they don't report in the lab. So possibly it is an MTHFR deficiency. So, so and it, yeah, the paper, adolescent, adult onset, ad, adult onset MTHFR, if you look through the uh, paper, uh, it really fits into how he has presented the very spastic, paraplegic, ataxic child, who spastic ataxic child with more legs involved with seizures and subtle cognitive refraction, regression with white matter changes. So for me, the moral of the story was that if a child comes with white matter changes, which are not perinatal, we should always do a homocysteine uh, and what I have also learned in the first year, if the child comes with hypomyelination, uh, sorry, delayed myelination, we should always do homocysteine. So first year delayed myelination and juvenile hyper intense periventricular lesion always do have homocysteine. Dr. Eric, if anyone wants to comment upon the news. Sorry. Yeah. No, I just wanted if anyone else wants to. So uh, yeah. this is a treatable one then? Uh, partially treatable, yes. So, so there so should be some... should also see the follow-up after giving treatment. Whether yeah, know. so started betaine, pyridoxine and folinic acid today. Okay. And send the exome. So I'll update about the exome. Try your apps and the exome. Thanks, Dr. for the follow-up. And that's our last case. Um, so yeah, we'll meet again on the 23rd of December and yeah, kindly submit your cases by 21st to either me or Gita. Thank you. Thank you.